Uh, th thank you, Katie, for a very nice introduction. And just for, for y'all's information, Katie and I are what we sometimes call in New England barnyard cousins. And uh, so the fix was in from the start. So uh, actually, we, we, we'd, we'd never met before. We just, uh, uh, my mother was a worthing, uh, you know, when we started talking, as, as people do in New England, right? Um, uh, and, and so th thank you for having me here. Uh, I appreciate your hospitality. And, and I also have to thank the, the Border Historical Society way up in Eastport, Maine, who uh, actually sponsored or provided what's called a, a subvention for publishing this book and provided a lot of moral support, too. So I, I put a lot of stock in these local historical societies here in Maine. And um, while individually sometimes things may seem a little chaotic, you know, collectively, holy cow, what they do is, is just amazing. And, and I, I, I really love Maine history, uh, and maybe that's, you know, and, and I'm a maritime historian, and s certainly uh, Maine's maritime past is, is really, really fascinating. But um, when I was at Maine Maritime Academy getting one of the, the million degrees uh, I have, uh, I became obsessed with the War of 1812, because st stomping around in Castine uh, as, as a young man 30 years ago now, you know, there are all these ruins of forts from the War of 1812 and all these plaques and, and other information. And it, you know, I just, I got an itch that it took me 30 years to scratch to figure out, gee, what was this War of 1812 all about? And um, a lot of it's, frankly, pretty dark, kind, kind of ugly stuff, and we're, we're, we're certainly going, going to go into some of that here in Yarmouth, and ye yes, I'm going to name names, uh, and um, uh, I, I hope you, you enjoy what I have to uh, present tonight. So usually by way of a, a preface, I, 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 I read this little passage from the book, um, to sort of set the context, because you know we're talking about events in 1812 to 1815, uh, and here we are in 2023. Well, what? Why should we care? Well, I, I think there's a lot of reasons why we should care about uh, the years before Maine statehood. So, uh, if you will listen in on this for just a second here, today Americans obsess about disorder in the nation. Politics have become bitterly partisan, and the news media blatantly takes side. Urban elites and their rural counterparts vie for moral ascendancy. And there are widespread concerns about riots, coups, and what role the states and federal government have in maintaining order or quelling dissent. Some alarmists even predict the end of American democracy. My message to the reader is, fear not. The Republic has witnessed all these travails before and has not only survived, but generally thrived. My evidence lies in a detailed analysis of Maine's search for a new identity separate from Massachusetts from roughly 1805 to 1820. Now, I think m many of you may think that the choice of Maine is a surprise um, because we know it as the land of quaint villages, moxie, I just drank me a moxie earlier today, um, lobster rolls, which I have not had yet, uh, and L.L. Bean. Uh, it's sort of a, a political and economic backwater, I don't think that's cruel to say, um, tucked in an obscure corner of the nation. But Maine in the early 1800s was a very dynamic place, well-placed for international trade with the British Empire, with a rapidly growing population. And increasingly, its citizens sought independence from Massachusetts, ultimately becoming a separate state in 1820. So why did Mainers seek Separation from a large, prosperous, and important state like Massachusetts? In part, Maine's leading citizens decided that the time was ripe for them to take control. But another factor was a growing perception that Massachusetts treated Maine as a colony to be commercially exploited and its inhabitants disdained as uncouth rustics. So, what role does what, what I call North Yarmouth, it was the old, old name for the, the town when Maine was a part of Massachusetts because, to distinguish it from Yarmouth Cape Cod. So, um, so I'm going to say North Yarmouth a lot, but that really just means Yarmouth and some other bits that eventually came off it, right? Um, and, and, and here's my, my thesis, really, that North Yarmouth was arguably the most federalist community in Maine. And if you think back to your... Um, happy youth dozing through high school history classes. You remember that 
Federalists sort of come off as the, the uh, uh, bad guys. Um, and we'll, we'll discuss that a bit. But um, the thing is with North Yarmouth that it detested, as, as a community, the War of 1812 literally to the point of treason. Um, and one of the, the notable events was what, what I call a tax revolt in 1814 and 1815. And I think most damning is that North Yarmouth was amongst the first and the most strident towns to call for the Hartford Convention at the end of 1814. And of course, the Hartford Convention was where the New England states were going to get together and potentially talk about seceding from the nation and creating a separate you know, New England nation, um, which would have been a disaster, I think. Um, but uh, North Yarmouth, in the forefront of this movement. OK, so let's back up a little bit and talk about political parties. Back then, it's Federalists versus Republicans, also known as Jeffersonians. And um, we know uh, the, probably the most famous Federalist is Alexander Hamilton, who's sort of an economic genius, an administrative genius, and who ends up just a little bit dead after he gets in a duel <laughs> with the um, sitting vice president of the United States uh, in Weehawken, New Jersey, right? So if you think things are bad now, and... <laughs> That they ain't good. Um, think about that morning in Weehawken where the president, vice president guns down the former secretary of treasury in a duel. We, we're not there yet, folks. <laughs> um, in Massachusetts, um, Federalists have a slightly different spin than Alexander Hamilton, uh, and it's really John Adams and, and other Boston people who are pursuing what I call in the book the Massachusetts ideal. And John Adams was a guy who, besides being a, a terrible president, uh, and our, uh, you know, he got turfed out after one term, um, had this idea that Massachusetts was superior to the rest of the nation, uh, and he would crow about this to anybody who would listen, including King George in England and, 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 and Frenchmen and everybody else. Um, and he basically single-handedly wrote the Massachusetts State Constitution of 1780, which is still in place with minor adjustments. Um, some of those adjustments coming about after Maine becomes a separate state, by the way. Uh, and, and in Massachusetts, Federalists had this ideal of deference, that there was a social hierarchy where you knew your place. And if you were a woodcutter, you didn't sass you know, the, the merchant down the street or the clergyman um, that uh, you were supposed to toe the line. And uh, there was a fierce protection of property rights so that the, the rich really controlled uh, um, the Commonwealth, uh, and that um, Boston had this very ugly way of controlling the entire Commonwealth, which includes Maine, of course, uh, and that is state senators um, were apportioned in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts on the basis of how much wealth each county had, okay? Which meant that Suffolk County and Essex County in Massachusetts had a whole bunch of senators, and Washington County had, you know, maybe one, right? So it was, it was a stacked deck. It was all about Boston and protecting uh, its privileges. And there was also a demand for religious conformity. Um, and if you're a Congregationalist, you might, you might not like this talk. And I'm not try <laughs> trying to to down-talk Congregationalism, but it, which is very different faith now than, than it was um, after the American Revolution, but um, the Massachusetts Constitution of 1780 actually called for a state-established Protestant faith, okay? And we say, oh, the Constitution says, no, no uh, uh, but th that can't be. Well, A, the Constitution comes after the Massachusetts Constitution by nine years, uh, and B, the Constitution only applies to the federal government. So there are actually several states that have tax-supported churches. And in Massachusetts, it's the congregational faith, which is 
all about, besides the religious elements, it has politics too. And we'll take the Reverend Abraham Cummings of North Yarmouth, um, who preaches from the pulpit that, get this, that liberty and equality were false doctrines that led to anarchy and insurrection. Liberty and equality were false doctrines. Wow. So this is a, there is a status quo, uh, a standing order, and it is reactionary. It wants to keep the common people down. And that's what Massachusetts Federalists were all about. According to your own historian, that's uh, William Hutchinson Rowe from right from here in town, North Yarmouth votes five to one in favor of Federalists, making it arguably the most Federalist community in the entire dis district of Maine, and led by guys like the Reverend Abraham Cummings. Okay, so, whew, that's a lot right there, but it's going to get worse. Um, so who, who, who are the opposition? The, the main Republicans are Jeffersonians, um, which is a party very much on the rise in Maine. They are far more democratic. They want uh, the vote for everybody. Um, voting rights back then, uh, not only did you have to be over 21, but you had to actually own property, as in real estate, in, in order to vote. So again, uh, that makes for a very conservative society. Democrats want to get rid of, of those qualifications. Um, Republicans support inland, like in the Augusta area, Palermo, other places. There are these agrarian squatters who are just you know, hacking farms out of the forest, and they don't care who really owns it, and the Republicans will cultivate their votes. Religious nonconformists, which in Maine, m more than anything else, means Baptists, could be a few Methodists, what I am. Um, and, uh, uh, and a scant handful of Catholics, mostly around Damariscotta Lake uh, up in Lincoln County, um, who really don't like all the, the congregational rules because, you know, well, as late as 1805, a, a Catholic priest gets arrested in Wiscasset because he marries a couple in defiance of Massachusetts law. Wow, 1805, that's really late for that sort of bigotry. And of course, the, the, the guy who is leading Maine's Jeffersonians is uh, a merchant from Bath, Maine, a guy named William King, who will in fact become the first governor. Now there aren't many of these Republicans or Jeffersonians in North Yarmouth, but there are a few, uh, and they're called the Drinkwater family. Um, and, and there are a lot of drink waters, uh, um, so g good on them. But there is this fierce political struggle throughout Maine, but really some of the worst parts happen here in North Yarmouth. And uh, in 1806, uh, an article appeared in the Portland Eastern Argus um, relating a, a, a terrible incident. And I'll read it verbatim, and then we can sort of unpack it. So it reads, daring outrage on Saturday night last, about 12 o'clock, a riotous attack was made upon a coasting sloop called the Diana lying at a wharf in North Yarmouth. The sails were cut and much injured. The fasts which secured the vessel to the wharf were all cut except one in an obscure situation. By this remaining fast, she swung her bowsprit over the wharf and broke her gammering knee and breast hook and then, to leave their mark behind them, the desperados covered the name of the vessel with black paint and painted the words, this is important, Black Sal and Jefferson on her stern and sides in a number of places. The sign of the post office was next the object of their fury, which they daubed with black paint. About the same time, a noise being heard near the dwelling house of the postmaster <coughs> His daughter hoisted a window when she discovered four persons who immediately run. This affair needs no comment. Um, so this is pretty bad stuff. And, and I think for us the shocking thing in 2023 are the words Black Sal and Jefferson painted all over this uh, vessel. 
right? And, and, and uh, Black Sal is Sally Hemings, the, the enslaved mistress of Thomas Jefferson. Um, so it was no secret, it, even back then. And of course, Jefferson was, was the sitting president of, of the United States at the time. So um, this is pretty awful, um, but it actually gets worse. Um, a couple years later, in 1809, the same newspaper uh, appears uh, an ad, actually. It says, $500 reward. It's a lot of money back then. The dwelling house of the subscriber in North Yarmouth, which, by the way, is spelt as one word in this article, which, which cracks me up, um, was assaulted on the night of the 7th of March last, and his daughter, again, dangerously wounded by a brick bat thrown through the window so that her life was for some time despaired of. Any person who will give information of the villains who lay in wait about his dwelling house during that evening or who perpetrated or who instigated or procured this outrage so that they may be brought to merited punishment for their atrocious guilt shall receive $500 from David Drinkwater, who is the local postmaster, by the way. Um, NB, nota bene, right? The same villains are suspected to be the persons who nearly destroyed a vessel in which the subscriber was a proprietor at a wharf in North Yarmouth about two years since. So um, local politics are very ugly, and the Drinkwaters are some of the few Republicans, but um, you know, the postmaster back then is a political appointment, uh, and so uh, David Drinkwater, apparently the target of this violence. And, and it has to be said, it, it turns out that David Drinkwater was not a very good postmaster. He kept the post office in a very inconvenient place. He sometimes gave little boys the mail to deliver, and they would sort of get distracted, as little boys do. Um, and uh, eventually, he, he, he was actually the, uh, fired in, in 1810. Um, but there's some, some, some ugliness going on in, in this town. Uh, and it's, it's really quite shocking when I think of the Maine I grew up in. It's such a placid place. And we had these sort of boring, milquetoast politicians who no, nobody got very excited about. We were, now I look back as just wonderful people, of course. But, um, um, and things do, do actually get worse again, um, because in 1812, the United States declares war on the British Empire. Um, for a variety of reasons we don't really need to go into, but um, there, the country was very divided about this war. There were a lot of people who said, this is not a good idea. Um, and uh, nonetheless, President Madison goes to Congress, and Congress agrees to declare war in late June of 1812. Um, and North Yarmouth is, is a bastion of anti-war sentiment, uh, so much so that the, the war supporters consider North Yarmouth sort of a nest of traitors. Um, and, and indeed, there were, there were traitors from, from North Yarmouth. I mean, the, the most egregious case uh, was a guy from this town named Samuel York Jr., who um, was captured, had, had the misfortune to be, be captured when he was on a Canadian privateer, a, an infamous Canadian privateer that had done a lot of damage to the local economy, a ship called the Liverpool Packet. And he was acting in the capacity of pilot on board the ship when a New Hampshire privateer captured it, took the P Liverpool Packet into Portsmouth, New Hampshire, uh, and, and he was tried for treason there, um, and I think, and I haven't followed this up enough, but there will be court records if anybody wants to go down to uh, uh, Waltham, where, where the local National Archives are, and go through the New Hampshire uh, district court records. Um, there will be the, the transcripts of, of, of his trial. Um, but as, if memory serves, he, he was acquitted, but I can't imagine people were very happy to, to see him come back to his hometown. Um, uh, there's another problem that the, the Republican newspapers point out about North Yarmouth is that instead of enlisting a lot of local boys, and, and the article counts 27 local boys, instead of, you know, it, it's hard times, it's wartime, um, it, it's hard to make a living, um, the American econo economy essentially collapses during the war, 
But instead of enlisting, like a good red-blooded American boy, about 27 young men from North Yarmouth go to St. John, New Brunswick, which has a, a, a roaring economy, and a lot of Americans are showing up there, although it's in Canada, which is, you know, it, it's, New Brunswick is a British colony, right? And local newspapers are pointing out that North Yarmouth is sending a whole lot of people into British territory. Um, and so it, it, it doesn't sit well with a lot of people in Maine. Okay. So why, why is North Yarmouth so treasonous or, you know, um, it's, 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 it's really kind of odd. And I think it's because of the leadership, local worthies from North Yarmouth, foremost of whom was um, Dr. Amy R. Mitchell, who is known in this town, sort of famous for, for, for his architecture. His, at least two of his homes are still standing in this town, and one is really beautiful. Um, he uh, is a physician. Um, he's a deacon in the Congregational Church. He is uh, a Federalist uh, and frequently the selectman or representative to the general court in Boston. And as early as 1808, it's becoming obvious that he um, has, has these deep Federalist feelings um, because he chairs a meeting uh, against the embargo in August 1808, which is quite strident in calling for the federal government to not put these trade restrictions uh, on American shipping. Um, and uh, he gets, uh, uh, by the way, David Drinkwater and other Jeffersonians in town write a counter-protest from this town. So, so there is opposition to, to Mitchell's finding. But um, Dr. Mitchell, in 1812, chairs a meeting here uh, in July of 1812 um, calling for a Cumberland County anti-war meeting. Um, and he uh, chaired that meeting. He attends the county-wide meeting. And uh, uh, North Yarmouth, and I think this is Dr. Mitchell's words, um, produces an argument that the war would introduce poverty and wretchedness. And, uh, and here's a great quote for you. Quote, Maine, ere long, will have nothing left but rocks, ruins, and demagogues. <laughs> Another guy, a congregationalist, who is involved in these very anti-government sort of attitudes is the Reverend Francis Brown, uh, the minister at the, uh, the, the local congregational minister. And you, and you would expect congregational ministers in this era to be anti-war. So he uh, is in, ordained here in January 1810. Um, he, uh, uh, from the pulpit, makes a lot of jabs about Jefferson and Madison, um, and he likened the war's declaration as ungodly and wicked and an alignment with the godless French Emperor Napoleon. So um, he uh, 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 repeatedly publishes sermons that, that are anti-war uh, with titles like The Evils of War, in which he asked, to what are we to attribute those enormous exactions which are imposed in the various forms of impost, excise, stamp duties, licenses, and direct taxes? He answers his own question with another question, to what but war? So taxes um, are clearly uh, something that he brings up, and that brings us to this tax revolt. Now, this is interesting because Francis Brown... Um, doesn't own real estate, right? I mean, the, the church owns his house. Uh, so so he's, he's good. <laughs> he doesn't have to sweat it. But, but I, th I think it's Dr. Mitchell, his deacon, who gets very exercised about the tax burden. And um, what you have to realize is that during the War of 1812, that the, the tax burden increases by up to 400%. And can you imagine having to pay 400 times as much tax as you pay now? I, I dare say you wouldn't be happy. Um, and furthermore, it's not usually, you, you know, you've paid town tax and, 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 and estate tax, but now the federal government is getting really into your business, and they would, would, would tax things like um, they would send an inspector into your home, and if, you know, if you had silver 
uh, that would get taxed. If you had a clock, that would get taxed. Um, and there's a wonderful story up in Camden about, about a woman who, who hid her clock when the tax collector comes along. And, and of course, it starts to chime <laughs> while he's there. And he, being, um, he understood her distress, and he just sort of silently got up and, and left, right? He, 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 he was kind of understanding about it. But um, North Yarmouth stands out as a community that dragged its feet in paying uh, the federal government's direct tax, even though it was a large and wealthy town by Maine standards. This town's Federalists consistently outvoted Republicans by more than five to one and led delinquencies in paying the direct tax throughout the war. By early 1815, North Yarmouth had 140 delinquent households out of 477, with an average tax of, it ain't much, folks, $2.90, okay? But uh, Amy Mitchell, by the way, had the highest tax, which was something like $30, uh, which was a lot of money back then. The delinquents included community leaders, such as selectmen and a militia major general. So important people. This isn't just the... the, the the little people, there's clearly very important people, and that's why I think it was a rebellion. And smaller adjacent towns like Freeport only had 23 delinquents, while Falmouth, a more populous community, had only 20. So North Yarmouth really stands out. Um, and I, I suspect it's uh, the Reverend Francis Brown and Dr. Amy Mitchell who are encouraging their neighbor, neighbors not to do that. Um, and. and uh, so, um, what happens is that Cumberland County's federal tax collector efficiently crushed North Yarmouth's tax rebellion. Republican lawyer Woodbury Storer coolly and methodically followed the law and posted the names of all of Cumberland County's tax delinquents in the Eastern Argus, Portland newspaper, Jeffersonian newspaper. Now, posting names was a standard practice, but Storer took it further. He also listed the address and description of the property. Um, so North Yarmouth's recalcitrant citizens, such as Dr. Mitchell, soon paid their taxes with only five exceptions, all of whom owed nominal amounts. So, so what he does is he lists all the buildings on the property, their value, the location. He really gets into your business and people aren't happy about having that exposed to the public. Now, it's, it's wonderful historical information, and I think some of the early historical publications in this town um, actually reproduced this entire list in its very first issue. It's, it's such good stuff. Um, but um, clearly, North Yarmouth is, is unhappy with the war. Um, and so as the war continued, and the war goes very badly for the Americans. Remember, the, the, the British burn Washington, D.C., right? You can't really claim that the United States won this war. Um, and um, uh, Federalists are increasingly proposing radical measures, including succession, especially after the, the British crash into eastern Maine and take over the, the eastern part of the District of Maine uh, and occupy it out of uh, Castine. Um, in September, Late September of 1814, which is just a couple weeks after the British conquered Eastern Maine, North Yarmouth proposed a convention of New England states to consider how to end the war, criticizing the Madison administration and its followers as, and I quote here, traitors after destroying our commerce and fleecing us of our money by a land tax, shop tax, stamp tax, and by exhausting the banks by obtaining money of these institutions and squandering it on Canada expeditions, Henry Plotts, and a host of pimps, spies, and other tools and partisans of the executive. So that's North Yarmouth. It's this little town in Maine. And, and it's not uncommon for Maine Federalists to be way out in front of the other Massachusetts Federalists and calling for um, pretty radical measures. Um, and and if, if, you, if you read the book, and I'm, I'm not saying buy it, but you know, take it out from the library, right? Uh, it, and it's, it's going to be a great summer for reading, right? We can tell already. Um, uh, that, uh, uh, you know, a, a civil war was threatening in the United States, and I think it was likely to start in Maine. So now the story changes. S quite suddenly and unexpectedly, in February of 1815, 
peace breaks out just after the Hartford Convention. And the, the Hartford Convention representatives who went to Washington to meet with Madison actually show up <laughs> after news of the peace and after news of Andrew Jackson's victory in New Orleans. And so uh, they kind of got nothing to say because the war's already over. So it's, it's quite embarrassing. Um, and so and, and New England and Massachusetts is, is held pretty much in contempt by the rest of the nation as sort of a traitorous place that really hadn't gotten on board being part of the United States. And, and I think they're, they're kind of right with that. Um, in North Yarmouth, a couple interesting things happen. Um, after the war in 1815, the Reverend Francis Brown, who repeatedly blasted the war in sermons, gave up his pulpit here to become president of Dartmouth College. And his successor took the pulpit at a ceremony attended by hundreds in the old meeting house, which dated back to 1729. So many people packed in that the structure groaned under the weight of the crowd, and some plaster fell onto a pew, precipitating a mad dash for the doors, while others tried to calm the mob with calls of no danger. The new minister, however, <laughs> leaped out of a window before it became clear that the building would not collapse. <laughs> it was an ill portent for the pastor who resigned a few months later. So you can see the, the moral authority of congregationalism, even in North Yarmouth, collapses. Okay. Um, all right. So... Um, to wrap this up a bit, I, I do want to say that not everyone in North Yarmouth was a traitor, um, and that, again, we find ourselves back to the Drinkwater clan. Um, Perez Drinkwater Jr. was uh, a privateersman, and he had the misfortune to be captured by the Royal Navy and put into a particularly infamous prison in England called Dartmoor, in a, in a part of England called Devon. Uh, and, and the doggerel about Devon is, ah, lovely Devon, where it rains eight days out of seven. Uh, so kind of like here today. Um, so, uh, and he writes really wonderful letters back to his family in North Yarmouth, detailing constant rain or snow, the inadequate food, and the thousands of creepers, that is to say bed bugs and lice, that covered the prisoners. And this guy was extremely bitter, and even expressed a desire to kill an Englishman and drink his blood. Now, this is in a letter to his parents. Wow, right? Writing that the British were, and I quote, worst of all the human race, for there is no crimes but what they are guilty of. Um, and, but luckily for us, he whiled away his time drawing an accurate rendition of the prison and complained, and, and his spelling is just hilarious. You, you really got to read that. I am tired of staying here in this loathsome prison, for loathsome it is, and a wretched place it is to put people in it you may depend. Um, and for him, things come to a head in early April. This is April of 1815. After the war is over, the, the British kind of drag their feet in returning these American POWs to the United States, in part because... Napoleon had got out again, and you know, Waterloo and all that stuff, but another story. Um, while the war was over, the British experienced difficulty in finding transports for the prisoners who became increasingly surly and impatient, taunting their guards and sometimes rioting. Uh, and the commander of the facility, a Royal Navy captain named Thomas G. Shortland, overreacted in one incident, ordering his soldiers to fire on the prisoners. They fired several volleys into the mass of men, leaving seven dead and dozens wounded. Now, while no main men died in the incident, two had limbs amputated due to their injuries and several suffered wounds. And Drinkwater seems to get through it all right, but he writes to his parents, doubtless you have heard of the massacre of Dartmoor in which there was seven killed and 38 wounded. It was done on the 6th of this month. The soldiers fired on us when we were all in the yard, about 5,000. They fired on us in all directions, and after we was in the prison building, they killed a number in the prison. It was one of the most wretched things that ever took place amongst the savages, much more amongst people that are the bulwarks of our religion. He's, he's making fun of, of the British there. I had the good fortune to escape their fury, but they killed some while begging for mercy after being wounded. They likewise kicked and mangled the dead right before 
our faces. Okay, so can you imagine David Drinkwater Jr. Com coming back to this town and confronting his neighbors who had been calling for the Hartford Convention? I, you know, I, I bet there was a seething anger there. Um, and I don't know if there were any incidents, but I, I would not be surprised. But um, uh, North Yarmouth, you know, trundles along as, as a Federalist community. It finally, with the, the other Federalist community, concedes that statehood is a good idea in 1819, and, which means that ultimately it, uh, that the, the Drinkwaters and their ilk, the Republicans, right, the, the Hicks, the, the farmers, uh, the little people, they actually win. Uh, and, and Maine enters as, as a very Republican kind of state, uh, and um, uh, Dr. Mitchell doesn't survive that for very long. He uh, died in 1823. I think he had a heart attack while he was driving his carriage along to go tend to one of his patients. Um, and that's the story of North Yarmouth. And, and I think it's a troubling story. It's, this is not the triumph in American history um, that we get told in school, and it's a, it's a much more complicated and I think much more fascinating history that, you know, kind of does reflect some of the things happening in 2023 where people are, you know, they're getting, getting, getting pretty, pretty anxious about things. Um, so um, that's really my presentation. I'd be glad to take questions, and then after we have fun answering questions for a bit, then, then I'll be glad to sign some books. So um, you, you may fire when ready, Gridley. Um, do, do you have questions for me? Yes, sir, in the back. Thanks. Um, I don't think you touched on the, the maritime implications, causes, whatever, of the conflict and, and sentiments among the residents, those that may have had maritime interests that were uh, <laughs> damaged by the, by the war. Well, so that's a complicated story, too, because um, there are merchants in town, there are ship owners, um, and they're Federalists, and Dr. Amy Mitchell is himself concerned in maritime trade as well. He's one of the big propon proponents for creating the first big wharf in town. So, yeah, they are economically damaged by um, the embargo and then the War of 1812. However, you know, the Drinkwater family are all mariners too. Uh, even that postmaster had, had that sloop uh, or their privateers as well. And they're getting hurt by it too, but they're saying, hey, you know what? Um, we're Americans, we're, we're, gonna, we're, we're, gonna, we're gonna endure this somehow uh, and get through it. So the, the maritime community is certainly not unified in its ap approach to, to the war. Um, but, it, but it's a good point, but because the, the war is fought ostensibly for free trade and sailors' rights. Um, so there is a strong maritime component. Yes, sir. Yeah, to uh, follow up on, on, on Ted's question, the coasting law, can you, bring, can you explain what that is and where did the North Yarmouth the Federalists uh, sit on that issue? Sure. So, uh, and that, that's explained sort of at the end of this book. This is a, a, a well-known story about Maine statehood that um, William King, who becomes the first governor, is able to work um, with friends in Washington to get some legislation passed. And not only friends, but relatives. His, his stepbrother is a senator from New York called Rufus King. Rufus King was originally from Maine. Uh, Rufus King is an interesting guy because he's from Massachusetts, but he becomes uh, an early New York senator, and he's actually the precedent for Hillary Clinton to become a senator in New York, even though she had never lived there. Okay? So, uh, and he's the most influential Federalist in the country, but his brother is the most influential Republican in Maine. But they, they work together uh, and they get some legislation passed that changes the coasting law. So what is the coasting law? So a lot of Maine trade was not necessarily overseas. It was schooners that went up and down the coast. And the original uh, administrative law that covered that said that um, a ship in one state 
could go, could pass one state, but then it would have to check in at the state, two states away, and go into port, get his paperwork checked, um, have to spend port time and spend money and waste time and all that going through this administrative stuff. And that works very well for Massachusetts because, uh, and, and for Ma- even better for Maine, because as long as Maine is part of Massachusetts, that means you don't have to stop in another state until you get to New Jersey, right? So you've you got a lot of coast, which means you're, you're avoiding a lot of bureaucracy and taxes and all that stuff that, that mariners r- really hate. Um, what William King is able to pass with, with some help from his brother is uh, this coasting law that says the United States, the eastern seaboard as far south as Florida is going to be one big region and you don't have to stop in other states anymore. And with that, even Federalist communities in Maine realize this is a really good deal and the, the last resistance to statehood crumbles. There's a vote in 1819 uh, for statehood. Uh, the, the Massachusetts legislature basically is like, fine, whatever. Uh, they're really sort of blasé about it. Uh, and uh, it, go, it goes to Washington, where it has to be approved by, I think, March 15th, 1820, in order for it to pass. And it, it's assumed that it is going to pass. And then another state applies for statehood, and that would be Missouri, right? And now it becomes a question of statehood. And um, nobody thinks that Maine's going to enter as a slave state, but the question is, is you know, Maine politicians are quite willing to allow Missouri to become a slave state if it means statehood for Maine, because they're thinking about the offices they're going to get. Um, that isn't so much the case with William King. His brother Rufus is actually the leading abolitionist in the nation at the time, anti-slavery guy. Um, but some of the lesser main politicians behave in pretty disgraceful way, even at the time. Rufus King is furious with main politicians about this because they will gladly see Missouri go into slavery uh, if it means that they get their offices, uh, you know, their, their government positions here in a new state. So that's sort of the story. It's not uh, very glamorous, I'm, I'm afraid. Uh, but, but I find that, that most, the process of most states becoming states, this is done by, by men, and I do mean men, um, on the make, right? They're not doing this out of the goodness of their heart. They're, you know, they're, they got an angle, and they are playing it for, for all, all it's worth. So, yeah, good, good, good question. Um, Sorry, I have sort of a dark view of, of, of things. But um, other questions? Any drink waters in the house? <laughs> no. Any congregationalists in the house? <laughs> Not, none will admit it, anyways. I guess so. Um, but uh, uh, so 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 that's that's the story. And um, Maine does become a state, and William King is its first governor. Now. He only is governor for about a year and a month, about 13 months. And he'd, he'd worked his whole life to be this. But he's like a lot of rebels. It was a lot more fun and interesting to sort of fight against the system. You know, the man is keeping you down kind of, kind of stuff, right? Um, but when, when he, it actually came to being governor, it's kind of tedious, actually. And, he, uh, and, and I think the irony of, of William King, who's a, very intelligent man and a very devious man all at the same time is that ironically while he came into power on the backs of these sort of rural farmers when he becomes governor he wants to institute policies that look a lot like Massachusetts policies that advocate for mm, active government interference in the economy because he wants Maine to get into industrialization like the Commonwealth of Massachusetts was. Um, and um, the uh, Republicans in the legislature revolt. They said, no, no, no we, did, we did not become a separate state to be like Massachusetts. And they vote it down, and King resigns after a mere thir- 13 months in office. It was only a, a, a one-year term back then, but he had just gotten reelected for another term when he throws in the towel. And uh, he goes on to 
other things. Um, and, you know, Maine is this funny state in my mind because, in part, it still looks to Massachusetts for a lot of its social and cultural clues, right? And, um, and I, I, I've got a very concrete example of that, actually a granite example of that, and that would be our state house in Augusta is, you know, designed by this, this, this bullfinch fellow from Boston who also designed the Massachusetts State House. And so we're sort of, it's an old-fashioned word, um, aping Massachusetts in that sense. Um, we wear Red Sox caps. Um, but, you know, we, we, we love to complain about the people from Massachusetts, too. Um, so... Uh, and I don't think Maine ever does fully separate itself from that sort of Massachusetts cultural dominance. And how could it? It's, it's a, you know, the population is, is small, um, and I think it's just not possible. But it, 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 to me, it never, it, you know, the state motto is dear ago, damn it, right? It's, it's I lead, and it should be I follow. Uh, you know, it, it just is not that bold of, of a place. So um, it, with the exception of, uh, uh, you know, bad alcohol policies. Um, so um, so that, that's, that's my, my, my take on Maine. Uh, the Chamber of Commerce probably doesn't want to hear that. But uh, oh, oh, well. Y yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, uh, in your book, do you talk about the uh, British getting control of eastern Maine? Oh, ex extensively. Um, and that, that's really probably the, the heart of the book, is the British occupation of Eastern Maine. And, um, and I'm going to talk in Castine tomorrow night about this. And so uh, uh, this is really interesting, because it turns out that Yankees, which is what I call the, the white Anglo residents of the District of Maine, um, when the British occupy, it turns out they prefer not to have their homes and barns burned and their livestock slaughtered and their you know, wives and children beggared, um, they will knuckle under almost every time, with, with a couple few exceptions like the Battle of Hamden and the British just dismantle Hamden and Bangor uh, and make it very clear that if you resist, this is what you get, and it's not pretty. So most people knuckle under. Now, I think that the really interesting thing is that the British general, he's, he's actually the lieutenant, lieutenant governor of Nova Scotia, a guy named Sherbrooke, is talking to a lawyer from Ellsworth, and the lawyer from Ellsworth is, is yammering at him and saying, and he's a, a Federalist. Ellsworth is right up there with North Yarmouth in terms of being Federalist. And the, the Federalist lawyer is saying, look, you can't take away our guns because the Republican trash in town is going to plunder all our homes. So the rich really need their guns. And the, the British general kind of gets that. That's, that's right in his feeling, too. You've got, you got to keep the trash down, right? So um, the rich are allowed to keep their guns in eastern Maine. And this, this becomes uh, sort of a theme in, in the British occupation, where even the, the sheriff of Hancock County um, says, hey, th this place is, is out of control. I, I had to collaborate with the British be because uh, it was just chaos that, that the, the lower orders were, were getting out of line. There's no real evidence of that, though. Um, but there's a lot of words to, to that effect. So really um, pretty interesting stuff. And um, most people just knuckle under. There are a couple guys, old crusty Revolutionary War veterans who say no, and they, they will even leave British-occupied territory, refuse to take the oath and all that. But an awful lot of people do knuckle under. And, yet, you know, boy, what psychological torment that would be to be in occupied territory, right? Your, your, your militia is just, just blown away by the British in, in a couple minutes in a, a brief skirmish, and everything changes overnight and you don't know how much property you'll have if you should stay should you go does this make you a traitor uh, I, I, you know um can you make this into an economic opportunity and there's certainly people who do that so it it, it brings out the worst in many people um so 
That's the later chapters. So you, you can skip ahead. I won't judge. It's, 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 uh, you know, so. uh, is, is, is that it? Um, you've been a, a, a lovely audience. Um, and for a town full of traders and, you know, <laughs> you're just, just really, and congregationalists, um, uh, re really lo lovely people. Um, uh, and I'd be glad, glad to sign books or talk to you in person or, or whatever. But uh, this, this has been a whole lot of fun, and I hope, hope you enjoyed it. Thank you.